G'day guys and welcome to Redriven. Now, the Holden slash Chevrolet Cruze, a car that too many is an utter piece of crap and apparently, potentially, one of the worst cars you can buy. But is there any truth to that or are the haters just being way too harsh? Like what actually goes wrong with them? Like why are they so loathed? What do they cost to own and operate? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? And most importantly, should you buy one? Let's find out. Now I should mention in this video we're going to be focusing on the Australian variants of the Holden Cruise but if you're not from Australia don't freak out or panic because everything we're going to be going over should relate to Holden Cruises or Chevrolet Cruises in your local market. Also to keep this video as objective as possible we've reached out to multiple Holden Cruise owners, former Holden technicians and engineers, we've trawled through different owner satisfaction reports and surveys so this video is basically the culmination of all of those expertise and experience. Now the Cruze is a bloody confusing car in terms of where it's made, the trim levels, the different generations, the updates, all that sort of stuff. Even in size wise, like it's, you know, it's smaller than a medium sized car, but it's larger than a small car. It's very confusing. But to try and explain it all, here's me doing a voiceover. So the Cruze was initially offered as purely a sedan in two trim levels with just two engine options, a petrol and a turbo diesel. And these early cars were built in South Korea by General Motors owned Daewoo. Then from 2012, Aussie cruise models, excluding the wagon, were built in Adelaide by Holden. However, over 60% of the components in these Aussie-built cruises were actually imported. Speaking of being imported, the cruise is quite the international car. Depending on where you're watching this from, other markets' crews have been made in China, Brazil, Colombia, India, Russia, the US, and even Kazakhstan. In terms of Australia, while it may seem quite patriotic to buy a cruise that was built here in an Aussie factory, Remember, this was a factory losing millions of dollars annually that was owned by a company that went bankrupt during the global financial crisis, plus the workers building the crews were told that during this period, their jobs would be no more by 2017. So hardly the environment for a car to be drenched in superb build quality and the absolute pinnacle of manufacturing expertise. Anyway, along with the change of address for assembly came a few other additions. The diesel engine was revamped and 1.4 litre and 1.6 litre petrol turbo engines also joined the fray. Plus from late 2011, a wagon and a locally developed hatchback body variant joined the lineup, while the levels of trim and spec expanded into a confusing array of various submodels and even a few sneaky special editions. And that's not to mention the mid-cycle updates in 2011, 2012, 2013 and 2014. And guys, look, we would love to go over every graphic detail and update in this video, but obviously that would just take far too long. But the thing is, we have gathered all of that information and we've put it in our very handy Redriven Cheat Sheets. Our cheat sheets are invaluable as they provide a full breakdown of the car's model range, its common problems, what you need to look out for before handing over your hard-earned cash, how much of that cash you should be handing over, and so much more. Check it out at redriven.com or in the link below. Now guys, if you own a cruise or like you're a cruise expert and you've noticed that we've missed something major in this video, please let us know in those comments. Obviously, look, we're doing our best to cover everything we can in the video, but we generally find it's those that own these cars that are the true experts. So yeah, again, if we've missed something, let us know in the comments. So does it look good? Look, obviously looks a subjective, but I very much doubt that anyone saw this for the first time and just went, oh my God, it's beautiful. Look, it's not like overtly ugly, but it's also not very attractive. It's just very much, here's a car, it exists. Like if the color beige was a car, it'd be a cruise. Now guys, if you are actually in the market for one of these, it's absolutely critical that you look for any accident damage or more importantly, dodgy repair work. See, the problem is because these things are cheap, we'll get to what they cost later, but because these are cheap, a lot of people don't insure them comprehensively. So therefore, if they have a bit of an accident, rather than getting it repaired properly, they generally get it repaired with a very, very tight budget, therefore probably in someone's backyard, and then they flip it to get rid of it really quickly. Don't be the guy that buys that. So, make sure you go over the entire exterior of the car and make sure that the paint matches both in colour and in texture. Check all the panel gaps around the whole car, they should all match up as well. And also look for any signs of overspray, so pop the engine, get under the wheel latches, get underneath if you can, and look for any signs of overspray. If there's overspray, it probably hasn't been sprayed correctly. 
Most importantly, make sure you take it to a licensed mechanic and get a proper pre-purchase inspection done. I actually went looking at a car recently for a friend. It was a Suzuki Swift Sport. On the outside, it looked fantastic. It drove really, really well. We got it to gym at Quantum Mechanics, got it up on the highest, and it had clearly had a massive, massive accident. Once you got up underneath, it was dodgy welding and you know, kind of horrible paint everywhere. So if you're looking at one of these, make sure you get a pre-purchase inspection done. Now guys, these things do have quite a few common issues and problems, even with the exterior, but we'll get to those shortly. So how's the interior? Well look, in design terms, it feels like there has been an attempt at styling, but then they ran into some pretty tight budgets when it came to selecting materials, because like, it looks fine, but it just it feels a bit cheap. I do really like the fabric on the dashboard. There's a nice point of difference, although it does have a bit of a habit of collecting dust. In terms of ergonomics and like driver position, there's so much adjustability with the seat, with the steering wheel, so it's really easy to get a comfy driving position. And ergonomics is quite good, everything's easy to touch. Now as far as wear and tear goes, this is where the, you know, the quality of materials starts to fall apart, literally, because this steering wheel, it's not leather, I don't, what, I don't know what this is actually made from, but it seems to be decomposing, even when you touch it, like bits kind of come off in your hand. Uh, all the buttons and switch gear feel kind of fine, but yeah, you can, you can tell it's been built on a pretty tight budget. Again, feels a bit cheap. Now in the back seat, if I were two inches taller and had been visiting the gym more, it might have been me that men at work were singing about in their song, Down Under. He was six foot four and full of muscles. This is in my driving position, and it's not too bad. Like, it's a smaller car, but I'm okay. Bit of knee, scrape against the backs of the seats, but plenty of headroom, decent amount of footroom. Not too bad. As far as wear and tear goes, look, this car is this owner's daily driver, and it's pretty good back here. The seats feel fine, all this feels fine. I'm not gonna say it feels like a new car, but pretty good for wear and tear in the back seat. How's the tech? Well, look, the tech is gonna vary depending obviously on the year and the trim level, but you know what? It was actually pretty good in context to what was available at the time and for this budget. But to explain what I mean, here's me doing a voiceover. The cruise was initially available with features like air conditioning, remote central locking, power windows, a six disc CD system, and trip computer, which all sound pretty basic these days, but for when these were released, at their price point, this was actually pretty decent. Later models received, depending on the trim spec, amazing cutting edge technology like cruise control, a multi-function screen, sat nav, which was crap, Bluetooth connectivity, which was crap, an optional rear vision camera, USB ports, and even Apple CarPlay and Android Auto were available in variants fitted with Holden's MyLink system. For all the graphic details of what cruise gets which tech, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. So, is it practical? Well, look, in the hatchback, yeah, like super, super practical. Plus these seats fold flat, giving you even more practicality. But if you want even more practicality, again, get the wagon version. But yeah, for a car this size, great practicality in the boot. Practicality in the back seat, you've got a couple of matte pockets behind the seat. You've got a little, there's a door bin here, but you've got to like dislocate your wrist to even get to it when the doors are closed. There's a spot to collect dust and crap here. And there's a couple of cup holders in the armrest. And that's it. And practicality up front, you've got really good sized door bins. You've got a little spot up here for like your fingernails or any excess flesh. There's a spot down here for your Thelma key ring. You've got a little storage cubby hole here on top of the dash. You've got two cup holders, which if you're like me and you like small pretentious coffees, you can actually put them in the car because this is adjustable both with little flippy bits and also it slides back and forth. Excellent point there. There's a little storage cubby hole here. There's also a little cubby hole down here. Pretty decent sized glove box there. Pretty good for storage, I think that's it. Nothing else, no. Oh, also there's this little, I don't even know what this is for, like it does kind of fit like a modern smartphone, but then as soon as you accelerate, the phone's just gonna flip forward. I don't know what that's for. Any ideas? Let me know. Okay, so what goes wrong with these things? Guys, strap in because this gets interesting. So let's start with the exterior. First up, the door handles. There are loads of reports that the door handles get harder and harder to operate the older the car gets. It's almost like the cruiser's testing your strength of ownership. The problem is they eventually break either internally or externally. And I don't know if you know this, but door handles are pretty important when it comes to actually getting in your car. Secondly, there are lots of reports that the chrome trim just flakes off. This plastic shielding in the wheel arches is known to split. There are lots of reports that the lights can just turn on randomly, even if there's no one near the car. Now, Holden initially thought that this was a problem with certain cruisers being haunted, or maybe it's just ghosts or the afterlife in general. But on further inspection, they found out that the body control module can just be faulty and play up and freak out. As you can tell right here, the black plastic can wear out quite aggressively and turn into this. 
Now inside there are quite a few reports that cars that are fitted with heated seats, when you turn the heat on, they only heat for a moment, then they turn off or they just don't heat at all, or sometimes they just heat even without asking them. Many owners have had issues with the buttons on the infotainment system being completely unresponsive, but that's because the radio's control panel just dies. The air conditioning and the heater systems can fail to cool and heat when requested. But potentially more serious than that, there are a lot of reports that the air conditioning can get really, really smelly. Also, the air conditioning evaporator behind the dashboard can fail and that can take hours to replace. Basically, if the air conditioning is stinky or it leaks liquid onto your feet or it blows air at you with the force of an asthmatic child, just walk away. Also, the reversing camera can just completely glitch out and just show a completely white screen. Maybe the owners complaining of that were reversing into snow, but chances are it's just stuffed up. Now guys, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with these things, can I ask a favor? Can you hit those like, subscribe, and bell buttons? And can you please share this video? The more you share this video, the more you hit those buttons, the more of these videos we can make, and we'd love to keep making these videos. Right, so mechanically, what goes wrong with these things? Well, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not qualified to answer such questions, but Jim is. I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you this, but these cars are a piece of shit. We see a heap of these in the workshop, unfortunately, and most of them are riddled with problems. They suffer from cooling system issues. Just about everything in the cooling system leaks at some point. The inlet manifold fails and everything connected to it has a vacuum leak. They suffer from turbo problems. They suffer from oil cooler problems. Just about everything connected to the engine and everything inside the engine and everything in the engine bay is just terrible. Their automatic transmissions are prone to failure and the manual transmission, if you have one of them and the clutch should fail, it's eye-wateringly expensive. Servicing costs are reasonable, but most owners don't bother because they hate them. Now, I should mention, all of these things are like the common issues with the crews, but when we were researching these, the lists of sporadic and one-off dramas are extensive, and that's a real concern. And it also should be noted that the amount of factory recalls that these things received is really, really concerning because many of them were genuinely dangerous. But in saying all of that, like any shit car, there are those owners out there that love these cars, that have never had a problem, that the, you know, the car is completely and utterly faultless. Well, surely those cars are out there. We haven't actually encountered one, but they've got to be out there, right? Also, this car features a lot of ants. I'm not sure if they're factory fitted ants or if they're an, maybe an aftermarket ant, but I actually don't mind having ants in the car because it's a bit like having a pot plant in your lounge room. It's just nice having some wilderness in the car. There's actually an ant on Sam's leg right now, but ladies and gentlemen, what beautiful legs. Is it safe? Well, the cruise received a full five-star ANCAP safety rating. However, that was from 2009, so it doesn't really count anymore. But for an overview of what the cruise receives in safety tech, here's me rapidly doing a voiceover. Safety features on the cruise include six airbags, ABS brakes, electronic brake force distribution, brake assist, stability control, traction control, and isofix points, but parking sensors were not standard until the 2013 upgrade. Again, for the full breakdown of what cruise gets which safety tech, jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. So, what's it like to drive? Well, it feels like this thing was designed for people that have absolutely no interest in driving whatsoever. Like, it doesn't do, it doesn't do anything overly wrong or overly right. It's just so... <sighs> Although, in saying that, the actual suspension or the ride quality is really good. Like, not Hyundai i30 good, but very good. Just off the back of saying that this thing feels like it was designed for people that don't care about driving, we find that a lot of motoring journalists seem to forget that a huge amount of people couldn't care less about how their car feels. They just wanted to go from A to B with minimal fuss as easily as possible. Which is why we're not going to go delving into the driving dynamics of the cruise, because let's be honest, the words dynamic and cruise should never really be uttered in the same sentence. So instead, we're going to go through the potential dramas and problems that you might find when driving a cruise. Now, thanks to the plethora of build quality issues that these things can suffer from, you might find there's a, like an orchestra of rattles and squeaks and thumps and weird noises. The problem is, those sounds are just probably going to get worse as the car gets older. Now, if you're testing an automatic version of these, like this one, this is an auto, just make sure that the actual shifting happens smoothly and when it should, because there are loads of reports of the shifting freaking out and holding gear or just changing gears rapidly, or the gearbox is failing in general, meaning the car just comes to a complete stop. And replacing the gearbox is gonna cost thousands of dollars. 
on the test drive, make sure you drive over some really bumpy roads and listen for any you know, horrendous knocking or grinding sounds coming from the suspension or the driveline. Also, make sure all the electronics keep working as well because again, there's reports that these things over bumpy roads can just fry the electronics. Look, overall, just make sure that the cruise feels tight and well bolted together. It should ride smoothly, it should accelerate and decelerate smoothly, it should brake in a straight line, there shouldn't be any tugging from the steering wheel under acceleration or braking. It just should feel complete. But in saying that, look, I know that sounds all doom and gloom, but this particular car is actually great. Like, the suspension rides really well, there's no rattles, no squeaks, it drives nicely, it accelerates nicely, the gearbox is fine. Everything in this particular car, pretty good. Pricing here in Australia kicks off from around about $1,000, but what condition a $1,000 cruise is in absolutely terrifies me. At the other end of the spectrum, for more recent mint condition low kilometer examples, you're looking at you know, 16 to 17,000 bucks. Something like this, a 2015 Equip with yeah, a few kilometers on it and in pretty good condition, you're looking around about $8,000. And for pricing elsewhere on this cruise infested planet, here's a graphic. Holden claim a fuel consumption figure of anywhere between 5.7 and 7.9 litres per 100 kilometres. Obviously depending on fuel type, engine, body type, colour, what clothes you're wearing at the time, all that sort of stuff. This particular cruise is claimed at 7.4 litres per 100 kilometres, but on this test we're seeing figures of 9.7. Holden offered a three year 100,000 kilometre warranty on all Holden cruises, which obviously means that these are all well and truly out of warranty now. And that's a shame because it feels like these really gave their warranties a serious workout. Servicing is recommended at every nine months or 15,000 kilometers, but we feel like you're gonna be visiting a mechanic far more often than that. So, should you buy one? Well, look, it's like when you're, you know when you're, like, you're single and you meet someone that just seems appropriate for the time and you somehow ignore all the red flags, but then a year or two later you're going, this person's a bloody nightmare, they're way too high maintenance, the positives are not outweighing all the negatives, I deserve better than this. That's the Holden Cruise. Look, if you've made it this far in the video, you're clearly an intelligent, insightful and critical thinker of sound mind and body, and you're most likely quite good looking as well. And I mean it when I say this, you deserve better than the Cruise. Yes, okay, they're cheap, but they're cheap and nasty. You're not, not nasty in the good way, like, mmm, nasty. I mean nasty as in, these are just a bad car. For what these things cost, we'd recommend an older, higher kilometre Toyota, Honda or Mazda over a newer, lower kilometre cruise. Actually, we'd recommend walking public transport or learning how to rollerblade instead of buying a Holden or Chevrolet cruise. Like, yes, there are the occasional good ones out there, exactly like this one, but guys, do you really want to risk it? Because we wouldn't. Guys, thank you so much for watching and what do you think of the Holden slash Chevrolet Cruise? Let us know in those comments and remember, can you please hit those like, subscribe and bell buttons and share the video. It really does help us out. It means we can make more of these videos. I'll also, go and check us out on the socials. See you next time. Holden Cruise. But if you're not from Australia, don't freak or pant. Blech. Here we go. So this video is basically the culmination of, actually I forgot a bit. Yeah, here we go. Bloody confusing car in terms of like where it's made, how many did here we go. Now guys, if you are... We'll start again. Now guys, if you already are... Uh, no. They have oil leaks. They have... Other things. <laughs> <laughs> I was really trying hard to remember that. Okay, okay, I got this. Thousand dollars, but what condition a thousand dollar cruise would be in absolutely terrifies me. I need to swallow and burp at the same time, sorry. <laughs> Ah, there we go, go from there again. A thousand dollar cruise, the concept of that, that just terrifies me. Don't buy one of those. No, I don't say that because it's the end of the video. Okay, here we go. What condition a thousand dollar cruise? Oh, Come on, mate. Here we go.